I peeked in after practice this past week and somebody said, oh, pastor, you're going to love this one. It's a toe tapper. I, was, I do love the toe tappers. I'm, I'm one of those guys that get so excited about church. I was like, David, loose them. Let them go. Let them run. Let them be free. And so, man, we, we get those in there and, and uh, they just do a fantastic job. And I believe that is a sweet aroma uh, to God's nose. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, if you are visiting with us, we've been going through a series entitled At the Master's Feet. And we've been going through some of the parables of Jesus. And just candidly, some of them are kind of difficult teachings along the way. A parable is really a short story that has a dramatic impact. And so, um, uh, as we're talking about this, I wanted to invite you, as you uh, have the sermon enhancer, to go back. I always want you to read in context. Context is everything. And sometimes people just read one little short passage, and they really don't get the full grip. They don't get the full understanding of what Jesus is really talking about. So this week, I invited you to go back all the way to chapter 13. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and start turning there uh, to Luke chapter 13. And uh, we're going to be starting there in just a few moments. But as we, we talk about this, is, is, it's important that we understand how they all work together. It's not just one snippet here and a snippet here. They kind of, there's a flow that, that ties together. So let's take a look at the top of 13 and just even the highlight of uh, the titles here. The first one is Repent or Perish. It's like, man, that, that just, that sounds like Jesus might be serious. And, and a lot of the ones we're going to lift up uh, just encourage us not to be lackadaisical about our faith, but make sure that we really know that we know that we know that we are a child of God, that we are a disciple, and we take it seriously. To repent means to stop sinning, cut it out, knock it off, turn around, stop going our way, and go the way that God wants us to go. And um, then he talks about uh, the, the crippled woman that was healed on the Sabbath and the Pharisees. Um, everybody kind of go, boo. Okay. The Pharisees usually end up being the bad guys, okay? Uh, this is one of the Jewish sects. And this is the one, and they were a very, in their own eyes, a very holy and a very righteous kind of people. And so they were very proud of themselves. And yet they're calling on Jesus for healing this woman that was on the Sabbath. He goes on to talk about the parable of the, the mustard seed and, uh, and, uh, and, and how much the kingdom that grows from something that is small. Then he talks about the narrow door. And everybody say narrow door. Because this flies right in the face of either nominal or casual Christianity that just basically has this no notion that we have an ooey gooey God who just is going to just have everybody be there. I want you to know personally, if I were in charge, I'm so codependent. I, w I don't want anybody to hurt, even the wicked, mean, and nasty people. I want their eyes to be open. I want them to be saved. And, and yet what Jesus is saying in the narrow door is that you want to enter through the narrow door. Because only few will find it. Do you understand what that's saying? More won't be there than will be there. If you think everybody's going to be there, that's called universalism, but that doesn't line up with our scriptures. And so Jesus is calling us to a deeper kind of discipleship by saying, enter through the narrow door. Uh, and then he stops for a moment and he, he peers over into Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem itself is on a hill and there's hills surrounding it, which means there's a valley uh, around it. And I, was, I had the privilege of being there a few years ago. And, and you can stop on the hill and look over the gates right into Jerusalem. And I could almost visualize Jesus doing the same thing that I did. Just stop for a few moments to peer over the gates. And he laments. He calls out, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. If you even knew that I was here and yet you rejected me. How I long to gather you under my wings as a mother hen gathers its chicks. And so even for these people who aren't going in, his heart is there. And he's calling out and he's, and he's wanting, he's inviting everyone to come. But he realizes not many are going to come. And so his sorrow is for all those who won't accept the gift of grace, who won't be there and in the great heaven. 
in chapter 14, uh, Jesus at a Pharisee's house. And at the Pharisee's house, he begins to, to share a story about their culture. When you invited somebody into your home, usually the most important people got the most important seats. How many of you grew up in a home where everybody had their assigned seat? Yeah, we grew up at a round table, so I'm not exactly sure what that was, but all I know is my father held the remote, so he must have been in charge. Uh, but many times, you can remember, I remember when we gathered together with, with larger family dinners, um, my grandfather sat at the head of the table. It was obvious who was in charge. And so in this culture, there were certain assigned seats for those who were of lofty importance. And then as it went down the line, then you were lower and lower. And Jesus says, you know what? Don't assume that you're the most important person in the room. How embarrassing, how gauche. If you go into your neighbor's home and immediately take the high place, he said, it's better to take the low place. It's better to be humble and then have the host come and get you to say, oh, no, 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 you are so special. Please come take the seat of honor. But how embarrassing if you just take the seat of honor. How you just assume that you're the, the brightest and the best person in the room. And he said, how embarrassing for the, the host to come and say, uh, I don't think so. You're on this end down here. And then he tells a story about the parable of the great banquet. And he's saying... Basically, there's, there's going to be a party, and everybody's going to be invited. And yet, suddenly, people are saying, you know, um, I've got to wash my hair on Saturday night. I, I can't come to the party. I'm going to have to wax my car. Uh, I'm getting a pedicure. I, I really just don't think it's going to work out for me to be there. And so he's saying, you know what? We're, all those who were invited, they're not going to get in. And so but you go out, and here's what I want you to understand about Jesus. You see, the people thought that they were, I call it all that in a bag of chips. They, they were self-satisfied. They were self-appointed. They thought they were holier than everybody else. And what Jesus was constantly saying was, you guys don't get it at all. And what they would do is if anybody was injured, if anybody was sick, they would send them out of the temple out of the community, they had to go out there because they assumed that if you're sick or injured, then you must have upset God somehow and he's punishing you and we don't want any unholy people around here. So they constantly push them out. And I want you to hear this. If you have ever felt lost, if you have ever felt outside, if you've ever felt less than, if you've ever felt marginalized, I want you to hear this morning that you are God's people. You have a special place in his heart. Why? Because Jesus didn't talk to the proud. He didn't spend time with the proud. He walked right by them, and he was continually going outside and bringing everybody back in to the fold. While they were pushing people out, Jesus was saying, no, these are my people. I love them. I care about them. He talks about the cost of being a disciple. Man, if you've just ever read this one by yourself, it's like, this is harsh, this is harsh, Jesus. This is difficult. The cost of being inside, he said, unless you hate your mother and father, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. Um, somebody else must have been teaching that. Certainly can't be Jesus. He says, but unless you hate your mother and your father, your, your, your children, your brother, your sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Like, um, that really doesn't make sense. Literally, it doesn't make sense. But when you begin to have the understanding that God is so holy, you can't have anyone higher in your life than God. Sometimes, if we're honest, we, we as parents say, I love God, but I love my children more, and I will fight to the very end for them. And, and God is saying, it doesn't really mean hate your, your mother, your father, your, your wife, your husband, your, your children. That's not what he's all about because he's all about love. But what you need to understand is when you put God first in your life, then you become the same kind that he is. You become more like Jesus. And what did Jesus do but love the people? You become a better husband. You become a better wife. You become a better parent, a better uh, child. 
is if you really get the first things first in your life. Jesus said, put the first things first and everything else God knows you need and will work it out. So these are the tough ones. These are the ones that should cause us to, to pause a little bit and question even our own faith, even our own degree of discipleship and saying, are we more like the Pharisees who thought they were there? Or are we like the broken, uh, the widow, the poor, the orphan, the downtrodden, the humble who say, you know what? I get it. I need a Savior. Everybody just say, whew, whew. man, that's heavy stuff. And then um, he goes right into three parables back to back to back. In, uh, in baseball, it would be a triple play. In hockey, it would be a what? Hat trick. All right. How many hockey fans do we have here? How about go lightning? <laughs> Three people. Woo! <laughs> go red wings? Uh, yeah, I, that's what I figure. There's going to be more. Yeah, okay, I get it. But anyway... A hat trick is when you score three goals in the same night, and I'm not sure why because I grew up in Florida, but people start throwing hats in the ring. It's called a hat trick, but there's three of them back to back to back. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son. You see, all of these teachings kind of are interwoven, and you really get an understanding. So once he gave us the hard teaching, and we meant, man, um, I'm not sure I'm there at all. I, I think I might be get, need to get serious about this. But then if you're feeling less than, if you're feeling on the outside, he tells us three stories in a row about how valuable each and every one of us is. So I want to share with you, um, probably you won't remember anything else except for this song. Um, because there's a, a, a comparison, a contrast. Uh, a few weeks ago, we did the, the sheep and the goats, and you didn't want to be a goat because Jesus said, I'm, I'm the gate. I'm the one. Only the sheep are going to get in, and we're going to separate the sheep from the goats. You're in, you're out. You're in, you're out. You don't want to be a goat. You want to be a sheep. You don't want to be a Pharisee. You want to be a sheep. How many of you know the song, I want to be a sheep? Ba, 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 ba. Anybody back here? All right, all right, couple of you guys. I knew I could count on you. All right, so you're all my rhythm section this morning. So I want you to do this for me. Come on. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't want to be a Pharisee. Because they're not fair, you see. I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to be a hypocrite. Because they're not hip with it. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to be a Sadducee. I don't want to be a Sadducee. Because they're so sad, you see. I don't want to be a Sadducee. Join with me. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. Turn to somebody and say, ba. <laughs> All right. Yeah, give yourselves a hand. I promise you, you'll be singing it all week long. It just kind of gets in there. All right. So if you don't get anything else this morning, you want to be a sheep. You don't want to be a goat. You don't want to be a Pharisee. You don't want to be a Sadducee. Um, the Pharisees, at least they belonged, uh, believed in the afterlife. The Sadducees are sad because they don't believe there's anything else past this world. So you don't want to be a Sadducee. You don't want to be a hypocrite. You don't want to be a Pharisee. Just want to be a sheep, ba 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 ba. All right, let's take a look at our scripture for this morning. It comes from the parable of the lost sheep, Luke chapter 15, uh, verses 1 through 7. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around him to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. 
But then Jesus told the parable, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and, and goes home. And then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you in that same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one, everybody say one, one, over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And let me give you a little hint about that last tagline there. There will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Jesus was telling a story that was just flying right in the face of the Pharisees. And they, you could almost see him say, well, I never, I never. And Paul tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So it's not a literal teaching that there's 99 who don't need to repent. But he's saying more rejoicing over the one who gets it. The one who understands and says, Man, I'm a sinner, and I just want to be a sheep. Ba 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 ba. All right, so let's take a look at our outline for this morning. Uh, sheep are humble creatures. I, I could have put a lot of things in here because honestly, how many of you have ever been around sheep? They're dumber than a box of rocks. Right? <laughs> it's like, man, that's why they need a shepherd. They need somebody taking care of them. They can't certainly can't take care of themselves if they fall over. You know, they just sit there and do this until somebody comes and gets them. You know, um, and, and yet we are called to be humble creatures. If we really want to be the people of God, then we've got to humble ourselves before a holy God and say, God, I get it. I understand. I, I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't want to one who pretends like I'm really better. And this flies right in the face of nominal or casual Christianity, which I believe a lot of people are guilty of, is they just kind of, well, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I walked the aisle when I was 12, and I got splish splashed, or I got dunked until I bubbled. And so I'm all good, and I don't have to do anything else. You're assuming you're just a righteous and a holy person because of some things you did. And, and yet what it is, it's, it's a conversion of the heart that says, I get it. When I'm in charge, I go my own way, and that leads me away from you. That's called a sin. I don't want to be a sinner. And I don't want to pretend that I'm better than I really am. Some people, when they have really low self-esteem, they go around telling everybody about how great they are. I grew up in athletics, and I kind of learned early on, the ones who said how great they were is because nobody was telling them how great they were. I just said, let your play tell it. And, and, and when you're really good, people will tell you how good you are. But trying to feel better about themselves, they keep lifting themselves up. They make themselves to be the hero of the story. Or sometimes we, we know people who pretend that they're even better Christians than everybody else. They're high and they're holy and they, they look down their nose. Sister Bertha, better than you. Hmm. And, and, and Jesus is saying, that's not the kind of people I'm looking for. You're in that 99 who already consider yourself righteous. What I'm looking for is the one who's lost. What I'm looking for is the one who really gets it. Sheep are humble creatures. Here's another line you'll probably remember. Snarky Christians need not apply. Sometimes when we think we're better than we are, then we have a tendency to feel better about ourselves by, by putting other people down. Don't you just love the people who love the people and they, say, they make it their job and responsibility to lift people up, to be encouragers for them? That's not what he's talking about here with, with, with the Pharisees because they lorded it over everybody and yet it was the humble ones. Sheep are humble creatures. And I wanna, uh, the, whole, the whole purpose for this teaching 
is because the Pharisees were complaining about Jesus eating with sinners. How many of you have ever ate with sinners? Okay. The answer is all of you. <laughs> and yet the Pharisees wanted to separate themselves from all those other sinful people so they would not eat with them. They would push them out in their culture to eat with somebody that says, we're on the same level. We're on the same wavelength. We're on the same plane. I'm okay. You're okay. And we're golden together. So let's get together and eat. And then they turn around and here's this Jesus who's supposed to be the son of God and he's eating with sinners. He doesn't even know the law. How can he be the Messiah if he doesn't even know the law? And in fact, he contradicts the law because he's going out and he's eating with sinners. The apostle Paul later tells us that the letter of the law kills but it's the spirit that gives life. That's why I encourage you always, context is everything. Read the full context. Don't just get, I mean, there's a scripture and says, if your right hand causes it to sin, cut it off. Most of you still have both hands, so you don't take everything literally. But it said, what what is he really getting at? What does he really mean by this? The letter of the law kills, but it's the spirit that gives life. Number two is that the sheep get lost. (laughs) Many of you have been on a journey in your Christian life and your spiritual life. And and if you're like me, you know, it just wasn't one of these who went kind of straight up to heaven. It was more like, but hopefully we're, we're still climbing as we go, but we kind of run up against things and, and we kind of fall away and we have seasons where we're hot and we're on fire and then sometimes seasons where we get a little bit cold along the way. Sheep get lost. I told you they were dumber in a box of rocks. Now, um, if you've ever been on an elementary school trip, usually they got you together in buddies, buddy up. Go everywhere with your buddy where your buddy is. And, and basically the, the mantra is stay with the group, stay with the group, stay with the group, stay with the group, right? And yet, invariably, somebody's going to get lost. Um, sheep have a tendency to be a little bit on the ADD side. So um, many times the, the sheep were held in collective for the whole village. And there would be several shepherds in charge of them. But because the greener pastures, they lived in a rocky desert area. So finding green pastures, they had to keep going out farther and farther to find green pastures for them to graze. But because they wanted them to be safe, then they would bring them back home again. But sometimes they would be uh, in greener pastures, stay with the group, stay with the group, stay with the group. And then one of the sheep would invariably go, oh, cool, squirrel. (laughs) Greener pastures. And they would just take off by themselves, not even realizing, uh, they're just not smart enough to realize they're not with the group anymore. And, and, and there were lions and tigers and bears, oh, oh my. Uh, there, were, there was all kind of things that were dangerous for them. That's why they were supposed to stay with the group, stay with the group, stay with the group. And yet they've wandered off into some dangerous territory. There's all kind of reasons why we as Christians go, squirrel, <laughs> sin is fun, <laughs> right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be tempting. And sometimes we, we look away from the group. We look away from the church. We look away from God and say, I know what God wants me to do, and God wants me to stay with the group, but it looks like they're having a party over here. It looks like they're having fun over here. And what God wants you to know is he has given you free will. You can make a choice to stay with the group or You can walk off and go your own way. To walk off away from God and the God's people is to walk off in sin. And God says, that's your right if that's what you want. And sometimes our sheep will get lost. But number three, if we do get lost, God searches for the lost sheep. Isn't that cool? (laughs) You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you have ever felt lost? Have you felt less than? Have you felt marginalized? Have you ever just woken up one day and said, I'm not living right. I'm not doing the right things. I need to get back with the group. And, and yet what I want you to hear and understand is that, that God loves sinners so much that he gives them 
their freedom. You can choose to do that. But what you're doing is choosing to live a life away from God. In one of the parables we talked about, the parable of the last son, it, it, he basically told his father, I wish you were dead. I don't want to wait till I, you die and I get my inheritance. I want my money now. And so he got his money now and he went it off and he spent it. Wine, women, song, dancing. I mean, he, he was so far away from home. And I love the way Jesus tells stories because they're short stories and they tell a punch. But the only job this, this man's son could find was slopping the hogs, feeding the pigs. And if you know anything about Jewish culture, they're not supposed to be around them. They are dirty, filthy creatures, and they're not supposed to eat them. They're not supposed to be around them. And yet Jesus says that this guy who is so far away from his heavenly father, that that's the only kind of job that he can get, the worst kind of job in the world. And finally, one day it dawns on him. We call it the Kairos moment. It's that aha that says, you know what? My life was better when I was in line with my father than it is when I'm out here on my own. I thought we were having fun. <laughs> there's, a, there's a country song that says, the senoritas don't caro when you have no more dinero. <laughs> <laughs> They're not your friends. And when the money runs out, the parties run out, your friends run out. And he was all alone in a pigsty, and it dawned on him, I need to come home. Now, the cool part of this story, and you can read it for yourself, is that when he starts coming home, he realizes he's given up his right to be high and holy. He's given up his right to be a leader in his own household. He's coming back and realizing because of all the things I did to my father, because of all the things that I've said, how, how far I've sinned, how far I've fallen, then I can only ex expect to be a servant. But even his servants are, are living better than I'm living. And so he makes his way home. Now, in their culture, it was against their, the culture for the fathers to run. And yet Jesus contradicts the culture once again when he says, when the father saw his son coming from a long way off, that meant he kept looking, he kept longing for years for his son to come home. And the second he saw his son coming home, he wrapped his skirt, his dress, his robe. He wrapped it around himself and took off running. Oh my, how undignified. But it's the heart of the father that says, my son has come home. Kill the fatted calf. Let's throw a party. All of heaven rejoices when one comes home. So God comes out and he searches. Even when we're far away from him, he loves us so much that he searches for the lost sheep. Real quickly, I want to tell you about the Qumran Scrolls. If you've not heard of them, some people know it as the Dead Sea Scrolls. When the Jews were being pushed out of Jerusalem, they hid out in the deserts. And the deserts was really like a rock garden. It's nothing but rocks um, that are there. And the way they found these, and the Qumran Scrolls is basically almost entirely the Old Testament as we have it. And it dates back 100 to 250 years before Christ. And what's cool about that is we, we've had the Old Testament, um, but there are still people who say, well, you know, people made that up, people added this, people took this out, they, you know, all these kind of things. But when they found this, they found it in 1947, and it corroborates the scripture that we have, dating 100 to 250 years before Christ. You can have faith and trust that this is the word of God. And especially when Jesus is reading from Isaiah, he was reading from the same Isaiah that we're reading from. It corroborates. But the way they found it is that there was a Bedouin shepherd who had his sheep out, and they were looking for greener pastures. And one of his sheep kind of wandered away. And one of the tricks they would use is they would pick up a rock and throw it on the far side of the sheep to scare it. They would hear a noise behind them and run back to the group. And he was trying to get attention of some sheep that had kind of wandered off, and, and, and he started throwing rocks over their heads. Plink, 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 plunk. And he's like, what was that? And so, curious, he climbed up into the caves, and he found inside of these clay pots that were buried the full Old Testament the scriptures. Now, the only thing that was missing was the book of Esther. 
And if you know the tagline from Esther, for such a time as this. <laughs> um, the sad note is he was an uneducated man, so he didn't know what he found. And uh, it was very cold that night, so he took those scrolls and he began using them to light his fire. <laughs> so he burned up part of them. But it's interesting that he used a method and that led to an incredible discovery of the Qumran scrolls. But sometimes God uses different ways of getting our attention, even frightening us. When we start off on a path in sin, it says, God says no, but I say yes. And it seems like it's good and it's fun, but it leads you farther and farther to a dark and a dangerous place. And I want you to hear this, that if you're one who's been there, <laughs> that God is sometimes throwing rocks over your head and saying, I want you to come home. I want you to know that I'm the safe place. And so he searches till each and every of the lost sheep are coming home. And then finally, number four is all heaven rejoices at the one who returns safely. Again, uh, they, the sheep were often held in collective, and so they would have several shepherds that were with them. And then as they, they realized, they would count them. You know, and if you came out with a hundred, you better come back with a hundred because they, they would get the price from the shepherds. And, and if you couldn't find that sheep or maybe one was uh, destroyed by a, a wolf or a lion or something like that, you'd better find that coat and you'd better bring it back so you can show them that this one got destroyed. Otherwise, it's coming out of his pocket. And so they knew that they had one job and that's to keep the safe, the sheep safe and get them back at the end of night. And so uh, when all the rest of them would, would come back home, they'd send the one out looking for that one that was lost. And then they would, you could almost see them close the gates because they wanted to be safe, but they kept guards posted and looking. And when a shepherd would find one that's lost, he would not just simply say, oh, come on, let's go home now, you naughty sheep. He would pick him up, put him across his shoulders and carry him home. And when they could see him, coming from a distance with the, the sheep all safe and, and, and wrapped around him. They begin to shout, he's here, he's back, he's found the sheep, let's throw a party. Now, I want to make a connection with some of you because maybe you, you, you have loved ones who have gone on before. In a few weeks in March, we're going to be teaching about heaven, so you cannot be afraid of heaven. You can be excited about heaven. But for those of you who have loved ones to go on before, and they are in Christ, guess what? They're with him. And it says, all of heaven rejoices when just one. I kind of liken it to a big scoreboard. And, and, and your name's up there, and everybody goes, Hooray! And then maybe you go off your own path and you, you fall away from God and you fall away and, and your name comes off the board and everybody goes, ooh. And, and then, but, but God keeps coming after you and, and, and somebody brings you home and, and you come safely back into the fold and your name goes back on the board and everybody goes, yay! Hooray! All of heaven rejoices. The people who have gone on before, they're not just asleep like we think they're asleep. They're alive. They're awake. Jesus said to the, to the thief on the cross, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. And so to be away from the body is to be with the Lord. And we rejoice over everyone. And you can almost see him, you know, peeking over the, the clouds or gates of heaven, if you will, and just saying, he's coming. He's coming. The lost one has been found. And all of heaven rejoices. I want to ask you this morning how you're doing. Are you self-satisfied or are you humble? Do you know that you need a Savior? We all need a Savior. Have you felt like you've wandered, like you've ever been lost before? Maybe some of you are here today are saying, I'm trying to get it. I'm trying to understand. I, I want to believe, but I still feel like I'm far off. To those of you who are still feeling far off, I want you to know God is calling, come home, come home. And if you come forward and if you join the church of Jesus Christ by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then not only, I, I've been talking with a few people and I said, man, if you guys ever come forward to accept Jesus Christ, we're go, 
going to be in tears, but it's going to be happy tears because another one has come home and all of heaven rejoices. Amen? Amen.